All right. Next, we have Isabel Langrock. She is a PhD candidate at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Her dissertation work examines gender gaps within open knowledge systems, including open science, Wikipedia, open source software, and activist attempts to bridge this gap. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, um, and thank you to our organizers. I'm very excited to present this work to non-communication scholars um, and the broader kind of open science advocacy group. Um, I'm intrigued to see how your response compares to when I've talked to uh, comm scholars about this work. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, a paper I've written with my collaborator, Mia Jovanova, who is also a PhD candidate at Annenberg, um, about gender gaps in communications um, adoption of the open science movement. Am I doing this right? Yes. Okay, so my uh, agenda for this talk, I really want to root us in understanding participation gaps within social science in general, uh, then within communication, and also this emerging body of work that's looking at um, gaps within open science. Um, I'll review our workflow, and I think this has two aims. One, to make you understand uh, the database of papers that we're putting together in order to answer our research questions about participation. Um, but also, we hope that this workflow is transferable and translatable across contexts. And if you take anything from this talk, it's that this should be something that you can reproduce in your own fields to better understand uh, inequality within uh, your field's potential adoption of open science. Um, I'll then kind of dig into our results. Uh, unlike the last talk, I do have some differences between men and women I can reveal, um, and then end with uh, some implications we can draw from our findings for uh, the OS movement and the OS movement in COM as well. Um, so gender gaps in the social sciences, there have been a number of studies that look across a wide range of fields to observe different rates of publication um, and participation in those fields, uh, including sociology, economics, political science, and psychology. I think as these examples show, these are both internal conversations that we're having in the pages of academic journals, as well as more public facing work uh, as evidenced by kind of the Brookings Institute or even in the pages of national news outlets. And this should be a, uh, of concern to us, I think, because uh, when, our, when our scientific body, our scientific researchers don't resemble uh, the population that we serve or the questions that we're asking, uh, we're actually missing out on vital uh, information or we're asking, we're not asking the questions that might matter to the population. Uh, some really inspiring work from Cassidy Sujimoto and her team has tried to uh, quantify what we might be missing by having participation gaps across both gender and race and ethnicity lines. And they find that we're missing, um, if we had a more equitable representation, um, so if we didn't have so many missing gaps, there would be 29% more articles in public health, 26% more on gender-based violence, 25% more on gynecology, gynecology and gerontology, and 20% more on immigration, uh, as well as 18% more on mental health. So these are topics of concern to the population. These are topics that we can have scientific answers for, but that we are missing because um, we don't have that representation within science. Uh, in communication, and specifically COM, unlike some other fields, is actually not, is definitely not the worst. I'll leave it uh, at that. So these are three different studies looking at kind of a range of different journals. They quantify, you know, authorship in different ways, and they have different time uh, time stamps at either end of their studies. Um, but they find over 50%, but not drastically over 50% of the publications are authored by men. Uh, what is interesting about all three of these statistics is they contrast pretty heavily um, with a positive kind of imbalance within our national kind of or international association, where of the members who opt into self-identifying, uh, and I think it's about 70 to 80% of people do opt in, um, 
uh, about 58% identify as women. So while we have 58% of participation within the communication field, within publication, uh, it's actually women are publishing at like 42% or 45%. Uh, and this trickles down into citations. I think the pipeline from participation to citation is not necessarily uh, fully fleshed out, but is definitely kind of implied in a lot of this literature. Um, and so these are two papers that look at uh, where citations go um, in two different samples. I think the one on, can I, this one here um, is a very new exciting paper looking at something that they call the citational elite. So this is the top thousand most cited people within of uh, all these comm journals. Um, and they find that 75% of those uh, citational elite are men. The vast majority of them are white and almost all of them are from US-based institutions. So despite being a international field, um, we do see a really profound lack of diversity at the people who are receiving the top citations. Uh, pivoting a little bit to thinking about open science, uh, what we're, communication as well as many other social science fields have started adopting open science and as an effort to do better research and to uh, increase transparency, increase access. Uh, we define open science very broadly in this paper, um, but particularly we're looking at three different kind of common behaviors, uh, replications, uh, pre-registrations or pre-registering hypotheses or analysis plans, and then lastly, sharing any materials or making them publicly accessible. Uh, there is, an, uh, as COM has uh, adopted more fully open, open science uh, practices, there's been an emerging conversation about what this might mean for the field, including some serious critiques. COM, I think, is an interesting example because it is methodologically diverse. There's no kind of, we're not known for one specific method. Um, and so applying open science is challenging um, and has, has brought up this large conversation that I think was uh, very well summarized in this piece. And of particular interest is they highlight that there is the possibility that open science uh, will further marginalize certain topics that are not well suited to the practices that are valued by open science, like pre-registration, um, as well as marginalizing certain types of researchers who are kind of not welcomed in to kind of open science uh, practices or the open science community, which you might be familiar with if you like ever saw the hashtag um, bro open science or bro open science. I don't know how to actually say it. Um, uh, so this paper is really building on kind of anecdotal or kind of troubling sense that open science, despite its promise to increase access to research might actually be restricting some of that. And what we want to do is empirically uh, test these claims. Is this true? Uh, that open science might actually be closing some doors. Uh, there is very little work so far on participation in open science, probably because it is so new. Um, this is one paper that looks at open science like in general. So this is not just comm specific, but she does find, uh, Murphy and her team do find some serious gender gaps. There's no comparison, however. Um, so we also provide a reference group of what we would expect um, the, this like, uh, participation to look at. But the important thing to take away from this slide is that it does seem like men are definitely participating more in open science uh, than women. Uh, so our specific research questions are that we want to compare who is participating in the open science movement with who participates in COM in general. And we're going to do that in two ways. First, we're going to look at kind of team leaders, so the first and last author position. And then we're also going to look at all authors. Uh, this assumes that every author contributes equally. So we just take a score of the number of women um, divided by the total number of authors for each paper. Um, we do hypothesize that women are going to participate less because of the concerns that have been raised in COM specifically. 
And then secondarily, I'm going to show you a like sneak peek of some research um, that looks at the open science movement and its leaders in general um, across the social sciences and how this participation might look. Um, oops, I went way too far. Okay, so our data collection comes from Web of Science, and then we build a Selenium scraper to download the full text of every single article. Um, and then the, the kind of key difficulty of this project is that a paper doesn't necessarily proclaim that it's open science right off the bat. Um, so how do we know which papers are following open science practices? And then the other issue is that there's no database where you can go and look up an author and be like, they are a woman or they are a man or um, what race or ethnicity they are. All of these concerns that uh, we're interested in if we study the inequality of academic knowledge production. Um, so we build two different workflows that we then combine to identify these two variables. The first one is we use the full article text in a uh, open science dictionary that was specifically created uh, using many of the, the journals that we also use. So it's been kind of pre-validated. Um, if you do take this out of this context, I would re-validate. Um, and then we assign if any of these terms appear in any in the paper, um, we count that paper as OS. Again, we're kind of agnostic to what practice in particular um, the paper is using. Um, and if none of the terms appear, we count that as like a non-open science. So that becomes our reference group. Um. For uh, the author gender, we do a kind of multi-step filtering process of first names um, where we use multiple different uh, databases to identify if a name is commonly associated with men or commonly associated with women. We do only use these two genders, so we are not capturing the full like gender identity spectrum of COM, and this is a serious kind of limitation of this approach, but it is fairly robust and efficient when you're looking at a lot of papers. Um, and we create two variables here. So the first one is this categorical variable of the first and the last author. Um, and then the second one is this gender score, the proportion of women authors. So this is a schematic representation of what our full database looks like and how we assign these to the various papers. Um, we also include as controls publication year and journal. Um, so now we can dig into our data. So we have almost 5,000 empirical articles published between 2015 and 2021. Um, and on average, 9% of them identify as open science or are, get flagged as open science in our sample. Um, that has been, you know, we see a very big increase over time uh, with the lowest of about 4% in 2015, up to 16% in 2021. So we do think this is a really kind of wonderful indication of COM really embracing the values of open science. But again, we're worried what this might mean for um, the efforts at increasing diversity within COM. Uh, interestingly, we see very steady uh, across all of, across the field, across our entire sample, we see very steady uh, rates of participation um, amongst our four kind of gender category, categorical author variables. So the, what? No, there are single author papers, so they're included in, uh, we just include them in the category that their first author, or their only author is. So like if there's only one author who identifies as a woman, we'll put her in the WW category. Sorry, I should have clarified that. So this includes single author papers, um, which also kind of explains that we see um, about one third of the papers are in the male male category. So they're either both male first and last or male single authored. Um, and the same is true for the woman woman category. And the other third is shared with these gender diverse teams. Um, we see that similarly, this is kind of the density plot of this gender score or this proportion of women authors. So most of our, our papers have this like trimodal distribution here. So we have these all male teams these all women teams, and then some, uh, a slightly fewer amount of the kind of gender diverse teams um, across our papers. Um, so our findings 
uh, so this is kind of the, our highlights, our findings where we're going to compare uh, those papers that are identified as open science with the papers that are not open science. So that's every other paper in our sample. Um, and so this includes, so our the not open science is the light blue uh, lines here, and the open science papers are the dark blue. And we do see a drastic kind of change in who is participating um, when you compare it to the field in general. So men, the men only teams are much more likely to participate in open science, um, going from almost 40% uh, of our sample um, of the open science paper is the male only teams. Um, versus women are much less likely to participate in open science, going to uh, just over 20% of our full sample. Remember that both of them started at pretty much equal at one third, um, which you can see in the blue line there. Um, and then the significance they're just testing the um, thinks the expected or the they're testing the the OS versus the non OS as kind of our um, we would expect the distributions to be the same. We see no change with the gender diverse teams, which I think is interesting. I don't necessarily have an idea for why that could be the case, um, but. Uh, Really what's driving the disparity we see within open source is the over participation of men and the under participation of women teams. Um, we confirm these results by seeing if gender can predict whether or not a paper is open science. Um, and we uh, like uh, control for publication year and any journal level effects. Journal does have a small but positive effect small, significant, and positive effect um, on if a paper is open science or not. Um, but uh, gender has a very large negative effect on predicting if a paper is open science. And that is true uh, no matter how we kind of slice the data. Um, so then for our kind of the exploratory part of the sneak peek that I wanna show you is uh, expanding on this study to think about the advocates um, of the OS movement kind of at, at large within the social science. So this is not just calm anymore. It's a new sample of papers um, that in some way advocate or describe or critique or propose um, an open science initiative. Um, and there's about 3000 articles uh, specific to the social sciences um, here. Uh, and what we see is that men are participating quite a bit. Um, within the advocacy of the open science movement, although and both men and women are increasing over time, there's equal participation before 2005, um, but then participation rates start to diverge um, after two, for every year after 2005. Um, and then this is like slightly complicated of the co-authorship network, but what I'm really interested here and what I wanna show, which I think is promising for um, the open science advocacy movement is that if we look at the co-authorship network, so thinking of all the authors as a node and they have a connection with any other person that they've written a paper with, um, so you could think of someone who has a very central position within this network as having um, a lot of influence or of what kind of ideas are being proposed as open science. Um, so if you look all the way on this end, we actually see the particip women's participation um, as co-authors uh, is actually higher than they are in the general kind of uh, just as authors. So comparing them to their participation rate in general as authors of these papers, um, they're, they're more well represented within the most central, like most influential spaces of this network. Um, so I know this is, looks kind of crazy, um, but that's what I want you to take away from this slide. And I think that is promising that we do have women uh, who are playing these who do have roles of influence um, within open science, um, but they're not, thank you, they're not um, fully uh, kind of participating um, in open science at the same rate as men. 
Um, so just to draw a couple of implications for this, and then I'm you know, keen to get to your questions. Um, we see that our high level findings are that women are participating less in open science, and this has the potential to exacerbate existing inequalities within the fields of communication, um, and also puts the, the, the emphasis and the initiatives around open science kind of at odds with the initiatives uh, of increasing diversity within the field. So there is a tension there that we need to work out since both of these movements are concerned with uh, bettering the field of science um, and doing both more rigorous research and more impactful research. Uh, we recommend that uh, instead of thinking of these as two separate movements of diversity and open science, we should think of and uh, build ways for them to come together and to uh, kind of fight the same fight. Uh, why should they be separate if they both have these, um, if they're both concerned with building better science? Um, and then we also advocate for building uh, more accessible paths into open science. There's a lot of gatekeeping around what is or what is not open science, and especially as applied to a methodologically diverse field, there needs to be room for, you know, kind of experimenting and thinking through uh, what it means to share data if that data isn't necessarily, you know, the results of a survey or an internet experiment, but are instead focus groups or uh, ethnographic research. Um, so thank you. Look forward to your to your questions. Oh, thank you, Isabel. That was a great talk. Um, can I try a hypothesis out on you on your the early data that you were showing the the main part of the paper with Mia? Yes. Um, and you tell me if you've measured it and if it's wrong. So I was thinking about what might make me be on a team to do open science. When I, when I think about open science, it takes generally more patience, more resources, at the very least to like be able to wait to do a pre-registration or afford to make your data public and all that work. And so my hunch should be that a lot of these teams would be bigger teams uh, because there's more people involved. Uh, but to be a, a really big team and not have mixed gender might be really odd. So those two extremes of only men, only women, I'm wondering if those are smaller teams. And then again, total hypothesis would be if you think about what few small teams of men can afford to invest in open science, there might be more of them. They might have better established careers, you know, tenure, tenured, whereas maybe there are fewer women who are tenured and have those resources. And so that's why maybe the, uh, there's a lower percentage of them. And so basically, is there a size of team effect would be my hypothesis could be totally off here. We don't control for it in our analysis, but I'm pretty sure the average team size for both the open science and the like full uh, sample is about, it's like 4.4 to, and one is 4.4 and one is 4.6. Uh, so they're, they're on average very similar, um, but I, I'll have to, I'd have to go back to the data to see if there is kind of an effect of some of the outliers um, of team size. Com in general, it doesn't have a ton of like mass collaborations specifically in the journals that we're looking at. So it's it's more on the like single author to maybe like eight authors um, versus like very big collaborations that you might see in some other fields. But thank you, that's a great, great idea. Thank you very much for the talk. It's very uh, important that you're thinking about this and exploring these topics. Thank you very much. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the one thought question I had is how, how com specific is it? Are there research methods, and how how costly will it be for you and your team to expand to a, so other social sciences? Yeah, I think the com specific part. The only part I'd be worried about is if that dictionary doesn't translate. So we're using a dictionary done by other com scholars um, that was validated on a very similar selection of articles. We expand by one or two years, I think. Um, so that would be the one part that I would caution anyone who wants to repeat this in their field to, to kind of validate that. Um, but cost-wise, um, 
it's not a heavy lift to do this project. You need like some computing power, otherwise it'll take forever to download all those papers. Um, but you need the biggest kind of barrier, I think would be you need a kind of proxy or like library proxy in order to get past uh, journal firewalls because a lot of them are behind, you know, a paywall. Um, and then, uh, it, the the gender assignment process doesn't work very well for non kind of Western names, um, which is a problem we ran into quite a bit, um, and we had to do a manual validation. So I think I don't know the exact number. I remember calculating it, but about we had about ten percent of the names weren't returned with a level of confidence that we were happy with through the two kind of. Uh, computational processes. So we did a manual validation on those, that percent. And of that, it was like something like 70% were um, particularly uh, Chinese names. Um, so this is, you know, when, when you get into inequality research, everything is intersectional and all of these identities um, start to become very important. It raises the salience of these other areas um, of inequality. And so that is something that I would caution um, and think about uh, that we need to improve kind of doing this research um, so that we can better report on those. Um, when I take this to comm conferences, I also usually end with a idea that we should build a database where people can self-identify um, what identities they wanna be known. Also that gets us out of using the gender binary. Uh, we can better capture people who don't um, identify with either man or woman um, and also lets us better capture uh, race and ethnicity, which uh, in research in that citational elite paper, uh, they use uh, kind of biographies and pictures to kind of guess at what the race and ethnicity is, which comes again with kind of a bunch of assumptions and hosts. Um, so yeah, I think we're really at the beginning stages of doing this in a, in a rigorous and kind of large scale way um, to and doing it ethically and well, but thank you. Hi, Mario, and sorry for jumping in before. I was just very curious of uh, yeah, the no, data. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, two questions, again, relating to the data. One, if I can correctly understood, you had in total around 4,500 articles, but only 9% or 10% were open uh, science. Um, but did you double count the same researchers? So if a research group published several papers within those years, within those journals, are they counted only once or are they counted for each publication that they have and belong to those groups? Because we are talking here a comparison of four groups of under 100 samples based on what you've said, if it's only 10, it's 450, you know, papers, four groups of potential categories. So the sample size isn't that big right. for them. So that, that's why I wonder, and if, if you didn't, if you'd counted the same group more than once, then the sample is even, it, much, much smaller. And the reason why I mentioned that we've seen in other studies that the um, the gender distribution is very dependent on the countries and origins of where the population of authors come from. So if you have the number of single authors of those 450, how many, do you know how many play in that role? And as a final comment, you may be aware that the Elsevier as a publisher has started the cross-publishing initiative to collect the gender and ethnicity data. So maybe in future, this will not require, mm. you know, manual. Uh, yeah, uh, to correction. the second point, I think it's great. I'm excited to see efforts like those. Um, to the first, I would have to go back to the data. I'm, we treat each paper um, as the unit of analysis, so we're not counting at the team level. So it, teams can choose to publish open science or not. Um, so we we took that um we don't assume a team if they publish one open science uh paper every paper that they publish is open science um so it would be counted twice for two papers because we use the paper as the level of analysis the number of people We have, um, we look at the number of repeats. It's not high. It's very, it's a very, um, like the, it's a lot of unique teams. It's a lot of unique author combinations uh, within our sample. There's not a lot of like repeat, like the same person published 
eight papers in our sample or something like that, or the same team. Um, that would be a worry, I think, for other more like lab specific, uh, I think lab specific and kind of goes back to Linnea's question about um, uh, the, the, the how size, how big a team is when you have like a lab model where everyone in the lab is publishing um, similar papers. I would be more concerned. We did some sense or not, we did some kind of data, early data investigation to make sure it wasn't, you know, due to the influence of one or two uh, people in our sample. Um, but thank you for that question. 